On your Friday episode of Locked on Raptors, it's crossover day. All week long, we've been talking about the Blazers and the third pick. Is there something there where the fortunes of the Blazers and Raptors and their current franchise situations might come together for a deal on draft day? We get into it with Mike Richmond of Locked on Blazers today. Trade negotiations, the motivations from either side. Let's get to it. Thanks so much for hanging. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Friday. May the 19th, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for nine seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on Twitter, at WoodleySean. You can follow, subscribe to, rate, and review the podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts, and on YouTube, of course. You can follow the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors, and most importantly, come hang out in the Locked On Raptors Discord, baby. It's a ton of fun in there. Last night... It was really fun. I was doing a Locked On NBA mock draft with all the 30 other hosts from the Locked On NBA channel. Uh, that, those results will be revealed at a later date. I'm not going to get into it. But if you were in the Discord, you were privy to the backroom conversations about trades and who I should be picking at 13 and also at 25. Did I make a trade? Maybe I did. You would know if you're in the Discord. So jump on in there. The link is in the description. Please come and hang out with our lovely little community of like 65 now. Total rap. Raptors sickos who I might have to put like a pause on the fake trade channel just because it's getting a little off the handle but that's the beauty of it come hang out the locked on Raptors discord okay on today's show Mike Richmond one of our favorites from the locked on podcast network from locked on blazers is on the show crossover city baby as we dig into the blazers and raptors and whether or not there will be any sort of uh you know meeting in the middle of the dance floor for the raptors and blazers at the trade or sorry at the draft as it pertains to the number three pick and uh you know we dig into the motivations of the blazers the motivations of the raptors and get into some mock trade negotiations as well is it likely that something happens here no it certainly isn't you would always bet against these trades happening but as we get into this is maybe one of those situations where while wildly unlikely it at least is realistic and kind of makes sense from both sides as well so let's get to it the conversation with mike richmond in just a moment here before we do that however today's episode is brought to you by bird dogs go to birddogs.com slash locked in nba when you enter the promo code locked in nba they'll throw in a free custom bird dogs yeti style tumbler with every order go get some shorts birddogs.com slash locked on nba okay let's get to it the conversation now with mike richmond of locked on blazers have fun Sean Woodley, Locked On Raptors here with Mike Richmond of Locked On Blazers for the first of what I'm assuming is going to be like a dozen chats between now and the draft because it's all anyone can talk about. Will the Raptors and Blazers come together and kiss and make a trade or will they just, you know, be on the walls sort of looking at each other longingly never to come together in the middle of the dance floor in the high school gym? This is a weird analogy, but you know what we're here to talk about. The Toronto Raptors and Portland Trail Blazers, a couple teams at sort of of strange crossroads in their uh, journeys as team their building patterns whatever you've got of course on the Blazers side Damian Lillard will they or won't they trade him will he stay with the Blazers uh, as he has said he wants to do will the Blazers try to build a better team around him by trading the number three overall pick after moving up in the draft the Raptors of course disappointing season all the fans in Toronto want to see the whole thing burned down uh but there's probably like a middle ground to be had perhaps in the form of a trade for the third overall pick so Mike We've been going back and forth. I, sh I sent you a fake trade idea yesterday. I actually talked about it on my own show, and the comments were like a pretty nice 50-50 split of, this is insane, the Blazers would never do this, and then the other half is, wow, the Blazers should definitely do this from the very many Blazers fans who were in the comments of that, which means I think I've hit the sweet spot of the fake trade like continuum. Like When everyone's mad, you've done a good job. And so we're going to dig into that trade idea talk about the different motivations at play here, maybe toy around with different machinations, but shall I show you and the people the trade that I've concocted that I think actually kind of works for both sides? 
Yeah, I want to be clear that Sean sent me this trade and I text him back, this is a bad trade. Let's talk about it. So let's do it. Show him the bad trade if you're on YouTube and then, and then uh, talk us through it, Sean. Yes, so the trade is, this is contingent upon, I should say, the Charlotte Hornets, Charlotte Hornetsing and taking not Scoot Henderson at number two, taking Brandon Miller because of positions or whatever, and Scoot falling to three. The Raptors need a point guard, potentially Fred Van Vliet, headed out the door this summer. I think some of the lottery fallout maybe even makes his exit more likely, which we can get to at some point. Uh, but in the event that Scoot Henderson's there at number three, this is the idea. The Raptors acquire Anthony Simons, Nasir Little for salary matching purposes or getting close to the salary, whatever you want to call it, and the third overall pick. The Portland Trailblazers acquire Dame Lillard's new co-star in two-time All-Star, two-time All-NBA forward Pascal Siakam. Uh, you said this is a bad trade. You also said, to give a peek behind the curtain, that this is the yeah, kind give, of trade you can totally see the Blazers biting on. And so yeah. let's start there. What are the Blazers' motivations right now? And obviously, it all ties around Dame, his future. He has made it pretty clear he doesn't want to go and do the whole let's play with a bunch of 19-year-olds thing as they tried to do last year. Uh, so what is kind of at stake with this pick? And what will the Blazers' sort of actions between now and the draft and draft night itself sort of hint about their plans with Damian Lillard here? Yeah, I think before we get into arguing the specifics of the trade, which is maybe what everyone wants to do, you know, fast forward, eight, fast forward 18 minutes, 18 minutes, 22 minute mark, we'll argue about the trade, I promise. But like, I think it's worth considering with all fake trades, and I think this is really important, I want to encourage everyone who's certainly level headed about this, you have to consider what the other team is after. What do mm -hmm. they want? Because not everybody wants the same thing. So what do the Blazers want? They want to build a contender in four months around Damian Lillard for a team that was not good this season. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do, but they are committed to it. At exit interviews, as Sean alluded to, Damian Lillard said, I'm done with 19-year-olds, and if the team chooses to go that route, he used this exact phrase, that's not my route. That is not a trade demand. That is an explanation of if they don't do it, I would rather go try, ply my trade somewhere else. And then the Blazers jumped up from fifth to third in a, you know, it's a deep draft, but I think there's a pretty clear number, a clear three, right? There's a clear mm -hmm. three best players in this draft. In addition, the Hornets, a point that uh, they only have one good player. He's a point guard. <laughs> so perhaps um, that's mean. I, I really like PJ Washington. He's a good player. Um, it's, it's Terry Rozier. You're cool too. Um, but it's, the situation has made it so the Blazers have some ammunition. But if they select a teenager on draft night, that is the end of the era. They mm -hmm. have to, have to. It is an imperative. They make a trade to upgrade this roster because they, Dame says he wants to build the roster. Joe Cronin publicly at the draft said, we want to maximize Damian Lord's timeline. You cannot maximize Damian Lord's timeline with a teenager. I understand there are fans that say, yes, you can. And you might be right. The team and Damian Lillard don't think so. So the option has now been stricken. It is now trade the pick to upgrade or make the pick and build with Dame. That puts them in a hairy spot. Puts them in a challenging spot. They want to be good. Mm -hmm. They want to be good right away. They want to be good in November. Uh, so there's no build. It means that they're going to cash in assets. However... Other than this shiny third pick in the draft, which is a very valuable asset, the Blazers are not asset rich. Hmm. They are, they have some things to trade, namely Amphrey Simons. And, and I, I want to ask you about this later in the show, but Amphrey Simons, yeah. he signed a four year, $100 million contract. He's making about $25 million a year. He got to trade money to take money back and is a 20 point per game scorer. He's, he's a good basketball player. He's 23 years old and has a chance to become a, a much better basketball player. He's a valuable trade piece. The number three is a valuable trade piece. Beyond that, they don't have a lot of stuff to trade. Shane Sharp's the other name that you're screaming about. If you're from the Toronto area, you remember this kid. He was a 15-year-old who was like a pretty good middle school football player. He turned into an excellent, excellent basketball player as a teenager. He's really good. The Blazers don't want to trade Shane Sharp. That's not their move. So the things they have to dangle are Ant. And number three, Ant is Amphrey Simons. Uh, he goes by Ant. His mama calls him Ant. Blame his mother. Um, it's But Ant and Ant and number three. So when you are, they're concocting trades. They don't want draft picks. 
They don't want youngsters. They want veterans that can help enter our beloved friends, slightly below us longitudinally, but spiritually <laughs> north of Portland, <laughs> the Raptors. We will be back with Mike Richmond of Locked On Blazers to continue the chat, get into the Raptors' motivations, get into some trade negotiations as well coming up in the back part of this show. Before we do all that, however, got to tell you about today's sponsor, which is, of course, our friends over at Bird Dogs. And look, people who have listened to the show for a long time know that I'm a very sweaty guy. It's just the way my body is. I can't do anything about it, okay? I'm sorry. But... Bird Dogs is wonderful because in the summer, there's nothing worse than being in a pair of shorts that defeats the purpose of shorts. Shorts are supposed to be a cooling agent to make it so it's free and breathable. And far too often, you get shorts that are just like made of really heavy materials. They're too tight. They're uncomfortable in certain regions. You get all sweaty and gross. No longer is that a problem with Bird Dogs because they have a wide selection of extremely comfortable and very breathable shorts. I got mine in the mail this week, and I got to tell you, they're very, very comfortable, very light, very breathable, something I'm going to be happy to wear around on my summer walks and stuff like that. And the nice thing, too, is they're versatile. You can wear them to the golf course. You can wear them to the tennis court. You can wear them to do any sport, but you can also take them out and go on a date or go to a Blue Jays game and sit in the hot sun and not feel so bad while you're wearing your Bird Dog shorts. You're not going to get too uncomfortable in that baking heat down the first baseline or anything like that. So go check them out. They have a wide array of Oxfords, khakis, gym shorts, swim trunks. Go check them out. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA. When you get to the promo code locked on NBA, they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. I have the tumbler too. It's pretty sick. Go check them out. Birddogs.com slash locked on NBA. So what are the Raptors after, Sean? <laughs> like if that's the stage for the Blazers, they want to be good. They have some limited assets and they have a quick timeline. Where do the Raptors fall? Because, and from my perspective, the Raptors were kind of mulling over these trades, trades with the Blazers last year, trades with mm -hmm. the Blazers, the trades with other teams at the deadline. And then here they are kind of the same stuff after a really um, tough end of the season for them. What are they doing? It's anybody's guess, man. This team could go so many ways, I would not be surprised, right? Like, they have three pending UFAs in Gary Trent Jr., shout out Portland, uh, Fred Van Vliet, and Jakob Pertl. They could bring all three back. It would be tough financially to stay under the tax, and we know the tax is going to be very punitive going forward here. But they can do that. They can find a way to make it work. And I think that would not be totally stunned if that happened. The team, as much as it was a disappointment, as much as the play-in loss was embarrassing, they were 15-11 and 11 after acquiring Jakob Pertl. They were the, top, the, the sixth best defense after the trade deadline as well. Like, there's something to build on there when you factor in the growth of Scotty Barnes, etc. The problem is the contracts and the sort of way they expire on this team's books they complicate matters. OG Ananobi is up for an extension this summer, an extension that I doubt he'll take because of the, despite the, the increase in the 40% extension that you can offer, it's just not quite at the level I think he's going to command. They can offer him about $26 million as a starting salary. He just made all defense. He's very good, and they value him highly. He's going to be able to ask for more from the Raptors, I would assume. Uh, and so they might kick the can down the road and wait for that and try to retain him when he hits UFA, when he opts out after next season. Pascal Siakam is up for an extension as well this summer. Uh, he didn't make All-NBA, so it's not a super max. But if he wanted to kick the can down the road himself, bet on himself to make All-NBA next year as a guy who routinely plays 65 Five plus games in a league with a lot of guys who don't do that maybe the odds of him making all nba are a little increased if that's the case he could earn the super max either way pascal siakam's about to get expensive this whole team is about to get very expensive very quickly and that's with scotty barnes being two years out from needing a new deal himself and so i think the thinking here for the raptors is how do we kind of reshuffle our books and also reshuffle the fit of the team you know, the Jakob Pertl trade, price-wise, I think was totally fine. A first-round pick next year, whatever. No one cares about that draft anyway. Jakob Pertl's a good player right now who addressed a dire need for this team. And so I, you make your peace with the cost, but bringing in Jakob Pertl, a guy who doesn't shoot, pairing him in a front court with Pascal Siakam and Scotty Barnes, who I think on their own work together, but with a third non-shooter in the front court, it gets a little more gummy, it's a little more tricky to work out. I could see them looking at Pascal Siakam as like the way that they kind of get themselves out of the corner they're kind of painted into. And look, 
I don't think the corner they're in is like all that undesirable compared to sort of the way it's being painted. This was a team that, despite their 41 and 41 record, had a positive point differential. They were, I think, 13th in the league in offense, 11th in defense. They had like a, like the 12th best net rating. Like this was not an embarrassment of a team. It just didn't work out. And maybe you bring all the dudes back with a new coach having fired Nick Nurse. And you get the internal growth from a Scotty Barnes who used the 13th overall pick this year. And you can envision an upward trajectory for this team. But there's also a world in which they stagnate and they don't do that. And so that's why these sort of big picture trades might be on the table. And there's something that really interests me about this one in particular, Mike. It's because when you look around the rest of the league, if a disgruntled star says, I want out tomorrow, the Raptors just don't have the package to go and make that happen. The reason the Blazers are interesting is because of the situation they're in. I can't imagine that the Blazers are going to be compelled by a poo-poo platter of draft picks in the future in exchange for number three and Ann Simons or whatever it might be to compliment Damian Lillard. Lillard doesn't want 19-year-olds, let alone 16-year-olds who have yet to be uh, drafted into the league. And so this feels like a very Masai Ujiri-like opportunity to capitalize on a Blazers team that is looking for a very good player and Pascal Siakam, if they make him available, could be the best player they could go and reasonably acquire with that I, third I think, pick. I think he is. I think he yeah. is. Um, yeah. There's a Joel Embiid dream out there, and I do not want to kill the Joel Embiid <laughs> dream for folks who are dreaming that. Dream away. But I, I think realistically, Pascal Siakam is the best player. Yeah. The money matters. He's yeah. making $37 million, and you're going to have to pay him after this. The money matters. Like for the sure. calculation, maybe a one-year rental. Portland doesn't exactly have a great track record of, of retaining high-level players, blah, 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 blah. But talent alone, fit alone, if you're looking for a two-way, uh, can play both forward spots and a little bit of center, has some individual offense, versatility on defense, scores at all three levels, even though he's not like this lights-out three-point shooter, but scores at all three levels, can make has become a much better playmaker as his career has gone on. Mm-hmm. Go, go find someone better. The, the the names that are better are like Kawhi freaking Leonard. Like it's just, <laughs> it's it's it's, it's true. Pa- Pascal Siakam is not perfect, and I don't mean to paint him as no. such. And I don't think he's like an MVP candidate type of player. But in terms of like what the Blazers need and what NBA teams covet and who's available this summer, the list is short, and he's at the top of it, in my personal mm-hmm. opinion. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I know some people will say, oh, Mikal Bridges, like, he's better. No, I mean, let's see him do it for more than 20 games on a bad team and throw maybe more than two assists a game. Like, it's he's, and, and he's different appealing. players. He's yeah. appealing because of three years left on his deal and he's a little bit sure. younger. It's just a different thing. So, like, you could argue, hey, I would pay more for that. Yeah. But I, it, to, to use a phrase, in a vacuum, Pascal Siakam is a better basketball player. Um, mm-hmm. It doesn't always mean that what teams want is different, but I think as just as a raw, better basketball player, uh, you mentioned the money with the Raptors. Is there, obviously you get way cheaper with Anthony Simons and the, and the pick not yep. way cheaper, but cheaper. You get cheaper with every Simons <laughs> and the pick. Um, and we can get into the specifics of that momentarily, but how much is it? Do you think they will be compelled to not go deep into the tax? Cause it, it would be weird. Maybe not, wrong but it would be weird to quadruple down on this particular team because of they were they should have been better last year maybe like yeah. four wins better maybe like they mm-hmm. should have won 45 games and it would feel different but they didn't and then they didn't win in the playoffs like it would be how much do you think the money is a motivator for toronto so like the the franchise itself has like endless money it's run by like the two big telecom companies who own all of canada basically so like there's no issue on like would they go into the tax? It's not like they're a small market team with a, with a cheap owner. Like they could do it, but I think the better question is like, is it wise, team building wise, to go into right. the tax? And right. I don't think it is right now for the team. We know that this summer the new CBA is going to bring in all these punitive penalties, not just for teams that are in the the second apron, but like also within the tax itself. Like it's going to be very difficult. There's repeater penalties you got to worry about, and I don't think they're at the time in their life cycle as a team where they can be like, all right, let's just go start paying the tax. Now we'll worry about repeater taxes in a couple of years. You want to push that off as far as you can until you're actually in the peak of that competitive window. So you can really maximize it and not get burned by all the downsides of being in the tax. Right. And so, right. yeah, I, I would be pretty stunned if they go into next year, 
and and pay the tax like they might go into the season like slightly over but you can get under by the end of the year and all of that like maybe that's what they do and try to figure this out but um ultimately yeah it's a big consideration and they've they've made their lives way more difficult by inviting an extra unrestricted free agent to the party in yakka purtle where they already had a full house of unrestricted free agents and so that's why you know anything that saves them some money and that that fake trade I, I rolled out there it does save them like seven and a half million bucks uh with nas little coming in as well to sort of sort of make things equal on both sides uh but any little bit of extra money they can save to sign yakka purtle to potentially sign fred van vliet or gary trent jr that'll be valuable and even more so it's about saving the money down the line for og scotty barnes precious achua if he is in line for a new contract in a year's time and then of course whomever they take in the first round this year and maybe whoever they take with the third overall pick if they can pull this thing off like they've got a lot of things to line up down the line and right now their books are very muddled i do think though their big crunch comes more next summer than this than this year and they can make it work and sort of run it back as it were this year for the most part maybe they like gary walk um but they can still stay under the tax and then figure it out later with their guys retained over the course of next year if they want yeah, to do at that. some point but they get there might not be an appetite for that though at some point yeah. they get squeezed because 100%. it's like Next if everyone knows that OG is going to walk or what or demand money, then when you get to February at the trade deadline, it's like, hey, remember when we were offering you multiple first round picks? How about twenty eight? <laughs> How about the twenty eighth pick in the draft? And it's like, ah, oh, crap. I guess we, you know, it's like either we have to do it and we screwed up, or no, we're going to stubbornly, you know, go win a playoff series and and try to convince them to stay there. Um, so sure. Which, hey, Let's the Raptors ahead. do have a long track record outside of Kawhi Leonard of retaining their guys and taking care of them. So I feel like they'd feel confident they could do that, but certainly uh, the, the money adds up, there's no doubt. And those punitive tax implications are really, really something you got to consider. We will wrap up the conversation with Mike Richmond in just one second. Before I do that, however, I have to interject to tell you be sure to go check out Locked On NBA Big Board. Raphael Barlow, Richard Stamen, Leif Thulin over there doing a wonderful job breaking down all the prospects going into the draft. Raphael was on the show last week. He's a favorite guest of the podcast. He'll be on again. But if you want him every single day, go check out Locked On NBA Big Board and subscribe to Raphael's uh, Substack while you're at it because it's very good as well. Great mock drafts and all that. Uh, go check him out. Locked On NBA Big Board, wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube let's you want to get into the specifics of this trade let's like let's yeah. get to the let's get to the table and start haggling it's time sure. yeah and so i guess for me this really begins with is scoot there at three for me okay I that's what i was gonna ask you why yeah. why not brandon miller why not brandon miller too much you don't want more have, forwards we don't need more forwards and wings and stuff like it's what just, about it's, scotty barnes is scotty barnes a point guard uh, not yet. He, right. you know, learn how to shoot, and uh, you know, it, like there's a lot of stuff that has to come for Scotty Barnes to really, I think, move into that role. And I don't know if it's ever going to happen for him. It's a really difficult position to learn, and um, you know, as of right now, I don't think you can go into next year, for example, with Scotty Barnes as your point guard. It, it's just, it's not yeah, going to be tenable. Big difference between point forward with some responsibility, playmaking responsibilities, to starting point guard. Hundred you know, percent. Yeah, game yeah. one. That's why Fred Van Vliet's so important on this team, and it's why if Fred's going to be walking, which I actually think the chances of that are increased after the lottery, I'm looking at the Spurs with all their cap space and a whole team of like infants, and like what a perfect sort of shepherd for the next era Fred Van Vliet could be for that team, and I'm a little worried about that. Um, you know, there's the Magic and all these other teams who have kind of been tossed around as potential landing spots, and so there's a real flight risk with Fred. And so that's why the Simons thing is really intriguing as like a replacement for those skills because this team can't go into next year with a pick out the door in the first round next year, top six protected, and not have a legitimate point guard with point guard skills and some shooting available. And so Simons might be able to scratch that itch, yeah. um, if you will. Yeah. What, what's the perception in Toronto of Anthony Simons' value? In Portland, I will say that I'm probably among Portland media members, one of the lower guys on, on Anthony Simons. And mm -hmm. even then... I believe him to be very good. Even then, I think some people think he's like has multiple all-star potential. And certainly the numbers, I will say this, if you look up at just his numbers with Dame off the court, mm -hmm. he looks like a starting NBA guard. Like he looks mm -hmm. like a very good starting point guard. What is your perception of him? Uh, someone who has not spent a lot of time being told that Amphrey Simons is the future. 
<laughs> See, I, I like Simons. I'm probably, like you, a little bit lower on him than consensus because I do fear like the defense is just never going to come around for a guy of his size. Um, and like that's important. That said, plenty of teams get by with not great you know, point guard defense or, or defense at the guard position, and they can overcome it. And with the Raptors' length, with having OG and Jakob Pertle there and Scotty Barnes as he kind of refines his defensive uh, sort of role and what he does best like yeah you could probably survive it with Ant Simons no problem as your sort of biggest defensive liability um, you know I, I ultimately think you don't want him to be like your only guard <laughs> right like which could be the case for the Raptors this is a team that has had like exactly one guard for the last couple seasons and so wow, you know, I think erasure yeah, uh, try learning to dribble first, uh, <laughs> then we can call you a guard. Um, but no, when it comes to with Simons, yeah, like I, I think his skill set is attractive to this team because this team doesn't have any of what he does. Ultimately, I think the real hook of this trade is the third pick if Scoot's available there. Um, and maybe the Raptors talk themselves into Brandon Miller being a better fit. He's a better three-point shooter. Maybe they want to go that down that road again. But ultimately, for me, Unless it's Scoot, I'm not into it because, you know, Brandon Miller, what's his upside as an NBA player if we're just talking likely outcomes? It's probably a couple-time All-NBA, maybe a couple-time All-Star. That's oh, a, you have one of those on your outcome. team who you can just yeah. sign for the next five years, and I would rather right, do that. The money's different. He's the proven. money's different. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, and it resets um, the timeline. And if you believe in Ant as a point guard, I think you could say, okay, we we're getting one point guard, but, mm -hmm. not, but not the generational, you know, not the whatever – uh, the whatever the comps are for, for yeah. Scoot, which is like Derek Rose mixed with Russell Westbrook on, you know, <laughs> something unfair, with, an unfair with, way to talk about a teenager. Muscles. But he, he might yeah. be really, really, really good. Um, yeah. And I, I think the p smart draft people think he's going to be really, really good. So mm -hmm. uh, before I, I, let me haggle on my behalf. One, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to include Nazir Little in the trade. I don't want to include okay. Nas because, um, I being like representative of the trailblazers, not myself. I don't care. <laughs> like, they can do whatever they want. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, because the blazers have so few mid range salaries, they basically have none mm. if they, if they trade Nas. And so then the only other trade piece they would have is, is Yusuf Nurkic and he's hard to deal one. He's maybe a negative value, uh, asset. He's not terrible, but he's just like, People don't want to pay centers $18 million for like a average to slightly above average, slightly below average, depending on which day you get mm -hmm. with Nurk. Um, so I'd really like for the like for my team building purposes to include uh, to not include Nas because Nas plus Nurk gets you to that 23, 24, 25 million dollar range, which gets you a, a second trade down the line. And if the Blazers can make that happen, that, you know, they need multiple things. Pascal mm -hmm. plus Dame does not get you into the contender category. Pascal, Dame, and Jeremy Grant is a pretty fun team. It's a fun yeah. team. But and and I'm I'm into it, but it doesn't launch you into that. It launches you into the like, oh yeah, this is a competitive playoff team, not like well beyond that. And I think that's the challenge that is that they're trying to be like, on paper, we're one of the four best teams in the West. And by virtue of that, we can compete for the mm -hmm. Western Conference Finals, et cetera, et cetera. So they need ammo to do multiple things. So I would. And, and I, I, you're going to say no to this, but let me, let me hear me out here. Yeah, please, if please I lay it am, on me. Please lay your terrible idea on me. Yeah, <laughs> listen, this is what it, fake trades are, right? So if I'm oh, the yeah. Blazers, I am looking for teams with multiple picks. The most obvious suitor would be the Orlando Magic. They've got 6-11 and 11 by virtue of the Nikola Vucevic trade. Uh, well done by the Magic. Um, <laughs> so if, if the Blazers were to send three and stuff for 6-11, and 11, if the Raptors were to get back six, would this be totally off the table for you? Say the trade is like six, the 23rd pick in the draft, Anthony Simons for Pascal Siakam. Are you just hanging up the phone? Probably, yeah, because I think you got to get a blue chipper if you're giving up Pascal. He's a franchise player. He's the face of the team. Like, he's been the best player on the team for years now. Like You're not just giving him up for you know a, a sort of middling first-round lottery pick, right? And, and that's not to say that you won't get someone good at six, you won't get Scoot Henderson or even Brandon Miller there. And, you know, our pal Raphael Barlow from Locked on NBA Big Board was on Locked on Raptors last week, and he kind of told me, like, 
6 through 14 is all kind of the same. Like, it just is going to be preference and whatnot. And that's one draft expert's opinion, but it's a very good draft expert's opinion. I trust him. Yeah, and he's really good. Ultimately, I kind of agree with that. How often do we see in NBA drafts, you get into that sort of 5, 6 through the end of the lottery range, and you have no idea the order in which the best players are going to be taken. You get Devin Booker at 13, or Jalen Williams at 12, or Shea yeah, Gildas okay. Alexander at 13. It's listeners, all Listeners, go hmm. back and Google the 2015 NBA draft. It is wild. <laughs> the lottery, the 2015 lottery is wild. It's wild. I was talking with a friend last night. Uh, shout out to Cameron Payne, last pick in the lottery. Um, <laughs> Raptors legend, Cameron Payne. Yeah, Raptors go. preseason legend, I guess. Uh, yeah. Never actually made an appearance, but that's fine. Uh, he'd be their second best guard right now if he was on the team. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I figured you would, um, you'd say no to the six and pl- six plus 23 because you want the blue chipper. What if I, what if I say this? If you don't trade Pascal now, the price is hmm. going to go down and you're going to end up with the same deal in a worse draft next year. Do you think there's a chance that the Raptors could get not squeezed is not the wrong word, but a little bit anxious to make to to make the move um, and value it? Do you think I know Sean Woodley wouldn't, but do you think there's a world where the Raptors would? Honestly, the Raptors are not the type of team to be like coerced into making a move and they will always default to (laughs) they'll always default to well, we'll just retain our guy and and figure it out later. And so, yeah, paying Pascal Siakam's next contract will be expensive. I don't think it'll be like an albatross contract. He's 29 years old. He's not the type of player who's dependent on athleticism necessarily. Like, I think it's going to be a pretty graceful age curve for him because he's all craft. He's touch. He spins. He's passing. Like, he is very He's honestly similar to DeMar DeRozan in a lot of ways, not just because they played for the Raptors, but just like the way they get their their buckets, the way that they sort of play apply their trade. It's very similar, and DeMar's aged wonderfully, and I think Pascal could do something very similar, especially if he can kind of recapture his early career three-point shooting, which he was, you know, 36 37% for a couple of years there. Um, and so, yeah, if they can't get a deal where they – actually change the face of their team and set themselves up on a new trajectory with a Scotty Barnes plus Scoot Henderson. By the way, we got to do it for Scotty and Scoot and the Slam Magazine covers that we'll have. Like it just It's so beautiful. The, the 30 for 30 title just names itself. Um, but if they can't get that sort of next guy to pair with Scotty Barnes to really set themselves up with a quick competitive window here, uh, they'll just retain Pascal. They're under no obligation. And he's the kind of guy who has said he wants to be in Toronto. He's not agitating for a move and, you know, hasn't done that public or anything like that. Fake. And... <laughs> loyalty as, is as fake. Chief, as a chief loyalty expert here in the NBA, I'll tell you it's <laughs> it's fake. Hey, look, because it everyone... is the NBA. 100%. Yeah. Pascal could walk next summer and, and like that would be very NBA of it to happen, but also uh he's a guy the Raptors love. He's Masai Ujiri's guy. He has been right. their guy since they drafted him 27th overall and developed him into this two-time All-NBA player. Uh they'll be more than happy, I think, to retain him and figure out the other money stuff alongside him and Scotty Barnes later. And so if you can't get a deal right now that is like truly game-changing for you, I just think they'll say, you know what? We'll hang up the phone and have fun trading for Bradley Beal or whatever it is. Yeah, that, <laughs> stop pitching me Bradley Beal. What? You, no, what? Okay, Damian Lillard playing next to another defensively light small guard who can score? This, they, this works, right? We've seen this work. <laughs> they already have pizza rolls at home, okay? They already got them. <laughs> <laughs> they, they really do. I promise. I prom- So uh, do you think they're more likely to trade Pascal or OG this summer? It's fascinating. Uh, I think they should be less inclined to trade OG because I think he fits Scotty Barnes as like a teammate a lot better. And he's just, he fits any team. He shoots threes and is like one of the best defenders alive. There's a reason a lot of teams want this dude. He's really good. And he's the kind of player that every serious contender probably has. And, and, you know, he is the kind of like last finishing piece for a lot of teams, I would assume. And so uh, he's the kind of guy you trade and you regret it for 20 years because it's like, man, what if we had a guy like OG Ananobi uh, every year? for the next 20 years there you go um with pascal i i think it's 
it's probably a harder sort of decision just like emotionally because there's a lot more invested in him because he is the face of the team because he's been the best player um but i do think he's the most likely one to get moved this offseason if there is going to be a big shakeup trade um and may, you could argue that that's the right move just fit wise just, you know timeline wise i'm not the kind of person who like really cares about timelines like the raptors won a championship with like a 23 year old pascal siakam a 27 year old Kawhi leonard and a 32 year old kyle lowry and a 95 year old mark gasol like they they i don't feel like every team has to have all the same aged players necessarily philosophically speaking and i do timeline think there's a only world matters if you're bad that's, exactly. that's what that means timeline when people talk about timelines they just mean this dude's 19 and he's not ready that's what yeah. they mean if you're the ready at 19, aren't bad yeah, yeah if you're ready at 19 like tyrese maxi at 21 22 i think he's 22 now but right mm-hmm. in that range it's like yeah there's no timeline they're not talking about the timeline he's just their starting two guard like he's ready to go and that's exactly the, that's so like if if scotty barnes were you know he just had the the sort of challenge of of development being non-linear is that mm-hmm. if he had taken the same leap that he looked like he was ready to make after his rookie season in year two there'd be no timeline discussion that team would just exactly. kick ass and, and if you trade pascal siakam and scotty does take that jump next season and right. pascal's killing it somewhere else you'll be like damn what if we just kept those two together what if we were patient what if we exercised the one thing in sports that seems like the like the greatest market inefficiency which is uh not panicking and just kind of letting things ride <laughs> Yeah. Do you, I guess, get out of here on this one? And I think we yeah. did this last year with the OGN and OB trade. Uh, we mm-hmm. talked at the deadline. He said, do you think this is going to happen? And both of us said no. And lo and behold, it didn't happen. <laughs> this trade or something very similar to it. Let's just call it Ant and three for Pascal and like whatever the other details are. Do you think it happens? Sure. I I mean, I always bet against trades happening because yeah, they very the rarely do come through. Exactly. But like, I, I think it's more likely, let's say, than they were to trade OG for the seventh pick last year. Let's put it that way. Sure. I, I think the quality of player at the top of the draft there, the desperation it seems like the Blazers might have here to try to build a team around Dame, the fact that they might have the best guy that you can go and offer as a teammate for Dame to the Blazers for that pick... I think it's far more likely than the OG stuff was last year, which I never really gave much credence to. The Raptors were not in any sort of position where they had to move OG last year. Um, So yeah, I I think while I'd still bet against it happening, I I think there's a very real chance that we see Pascal Siakam on the Blazers. Again, no intel here, just sort of reading the tea leaves and the situations of the teams. It does seem to line up a little better than than maybe previous uh, flirtations between the Blazers and Raptors in the past. Yeah, I think both teams are motivated. I would I read it the same way you do. Um, and like the chances of any random trade you propose happening is like under two percent, right? It's like in the <laughs> it's in the like half a percent range. I would put this one up like I'll call this a very good chance of happening, something like fifteen percent. Like you yeah. know, like it's it, there's sure. like a real a real world where that happens. I just think you know I think it's been reported by Josh Lloyd of uh, Locked On uh, Fantasy Basketball, Locked On NBA uh, NBA. Uh, that this that Pascal Siakam is like specifically someone that the Blazers covet yeah. um, for obvious reasons like Josh is plugged in and knows stuff but like you don't need to be plugged in to know that Pascal is likely you know very likely to be traded or at least so considered to be traded and that he would fit with the Blazers and yada 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 like it, it just it makes sense I think it's um, I think it makes sense for both teams I think working out some of the details is a little bit I don't think like my refusal to include Nasir Little is going to be the thing that blows it up. <laughs> um, but we'll see. And, and like you said, I think the scoot thing is important. This isn't going to happen until maybe the Blazers are on the clock, right? Like yeah. it's it's going to happen like draft night. Okay. Well, not on the clock. Cause like Woj and Shams were reported beforehand because they, they're just, just, just love breaking news. So um, they gotta, and, gotta have them scoops, man. You gotta have the scoops. What, what is, addic- what is sports without the scoops? It's addicting. So, <laughs> but it'll be, you know, it'll be, it won't be, it'll be draft night. If this happens, because both teams are going to weigh where there are. The thing is though, I will say this, the Blazers, there's some pressure on the Blazers to kind of get this done on draft night. If they, right. if they leave the draft with Scoot Henderson or with Brandon Miller in tow, Sure, technically they can be traded 30 days after they sign their rookie scale deal, but so much has to line up for a trade to happen after that and all those Mm -hmm. things. So um, I think draft night is the time, and I think in general, it could happen. 
hey man we're gonna try to make it happen and i think the locked on nba mock draft we do if, uh, if the hornets guys cooperate and do this thing properly and take brandon miller like the positional need he is for them yeah, yeah if we pull that off and need the, everyone knows of course so it's everybody's uh ask like what the the, the king's about that or uh, biggest need you know. available that's what they say <laughs> biggest need available <laughs> Well, this was fun, man. Uh, We should probably leave it there. I'm sure we'll chat again as this whole thing. There'll be more reporting and whispers and burblings and scuttlebutt and all of our favorite words for uh, rumors and gossip. We'll get into all of that. What was that? I said rival executives. They'll be out there. Oh, we love them rival executives. Just always offering the most insane takes on other teams. Uh, We'll leave it there, though. Make sure you listen to Lockdown Blazers each and every day. Lockdown Raptors as well each and every day. Make us your both, your daily listens over the course of the the run-up to the draft. Because our fates are intertwined, it seems. Much like they were back when the the, the... Damon Stoudemire trade happened. I don't know. I'm trying to think of Blazers, Raptors, tie-ins. We're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for tuning in, making the Lockdown Podcast Network your team every day, your choice for your pre-draft coverage. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Peace.